WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. If you've uh, sort of caught on on my new green screen out here to my new Hammer Jacks hairdo and all that stuff, usually the background behind me will serve some sort of uh, backdrop to what's going to happen here. So this guy at one point was uh, over here and went <laughs> over there uh, through the parking lot and uh, at one point was up on uh, Calvert Street and then wound up down in Covington and now is somewhere <laughs> in the cosmos out on an internet near you with children and writing stories and covering the off-season travails of this guy uh, over here. He is all things football reporter for the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say I miss you and Jameson because I know you guys don't miss me at all. But I do miss sitting in press boxes in full stadiums and having a beer in the parking lot and, you know, catching planes and being upside down at six in the morning and watching you and Preston try to figure out who's got more Marriott points. Like all of these things that were a part of my life for 25 years. It's all broken, Zrebeck. It's a mess <laughs> right now. I need a normal draft, man. I need like a trip to Vegas. I need a schedule before May 12th. I need 16 games. I need nine inning baseball games. I, yeah, I don't know. How are you, brother? What's going on, man? Good, man. How you doing? And I agree with you. I mean, this, this with the draft here, uh, this, it hits home. This, because I, the draft at the facility is awesome. I, I mean, it's so much fun. Um, you know, there's just kind of a, a they you know, feed you. Oh yeah, there's food for days, <laughs> and you get all the access you need by walking about ten feet. And there's press conferences or, or teleconferences after pretty much every pick. But it's just a fun vibe, you know. It's everyone's excited. You have new rookies coming in with these wide-eyed looks. It's, uh, it you stinks. pick first, you feel good. You pick last, you feel good. Absolutely. You, you trade up, you feel good. You trade back, eh, you don't feel good, <laughs> but you feel like, well, Ozzy must have been, must have seen something in that Dwan Edwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly, it's just uh, there's such a good buzz uh, around the draft, and uh, you know that's definitely missed uh, along with a lot of other things. But everything's good. Thanks for having me. Well, I appreciate, you know, I, I have not contributed much to Ravens history. I mean, a few things, maybe Whiskey Joe's or a parade here again. But I am absolutely honored that whenever I started calling it the Liars Lunch, and right around 98 <laughs> or 99, the Kevin Burns somehow picked it up, and it has now become part of Lexicon. Yes. So uh, I, I watched the Liars Luncheon. This is where I am. And I'll be a little flippant because I am. So um, I haven't interacted with Ravens people at all. I haven't sat with anybody. I've had no on the record offer, like literally nothing like in a year. Right. So they do this thing and I'm on a golf course from Mount Washington pediatric with Leonard Raskin, Raskin Global and Roots Chris doing good stuff out there. Incredible. Raised a lot of money. Uh, first thing I've done in 14 months where there's like people. It was weird. Yeah. Man. We all had masks on. I'm talking to dudes, we both had masks on. They don't know who I am because I look different, uh, mm -hmm. as was pointed out. Um, and I can't see their faces, right? Uh, I left the course to go up to sit in a car now, right, to watch the Liars lunch. And then I named where we used to get fed for real. Like they had cookies and desserts and, and, and sorbets and good stuff, iced tea stuff, you know. And now I'm in a car on a golf course watching this on my phone, trying to raise my hand and make my mic work. And I ask a question. They blew it off. Eric blew it to John. John called it vague. I got no answer. And I thought, Wow, I named this thing the right thing, right? I mean, they, you know, tight-lipped and reporters and where we are now. I don't want to say they got us where they want us, but if you want things to be quiet and you want to sneak Lamar Jackson into the building, which Eric uh, talked about at length at the Liars Luncheon this week, this is a year that the Ravens should clean up because they have their act together. They're better at scouting than anyone else. No one has any tape on anyone. This is one of those years where I think they're sort of laying in the weeds and feel like this is great opportunity opportunity and value for them because they have a, a competitive advantage. I think the most organizations. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. And you're right. I mean, you know, we're about a week out of the draft and have, you know, there's no reports of so-and-so prospect is coming in for a visit and somebody's hot on this prospect. Uh, you know, they've conducted like hundreds of phone calls and zoom calls and, and went to all these all-star games, but uh, you know, there's going to be uncertainty in this whole process more than ever before. And the Ravens have been preparing for this for a long time, not just 
the draft, but the whole scouting process and how do you scout uh, when there were so few games and when some guys opted out, um, you know, and they, uh, you know, the Ravens fashion themselves as an organization that finds creative ways to do things and different ways of getting information. Uh, and they view themselves as cutting edge. So uh, that'll be on full display. Um, but yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, you know, that, that luncheon, I, you know, back in the day, you know, it, it was you, convivial yeah. in the same way off the records convivial in the same way that like, yeah. we care and, a lot. They should care that we care a lot. The more we know, the better it is for the fan in that way. But I, I mean, he gave me Marte Jenkins 20 years ago and didn't, you know, like I'm not expecting anything them to yeah. feed me information about this, but I do read the tea leaves, Jeff. And I would yeah, say no this question. one thing I tea leaved a little bit because Eric likes to give out little Riddler clues mm -hmm. in his, you know what I mean? Oh, like he I, loves I, playing the game. Oh yeah. man, I'm sure he goes back and he and Cocaine mm -hmm. is texting. He's like, you know, did I put a salt word song from Pearl Jam in there that would lead them to believe that I want the yellow lead better um, or something. But but any I, I, I captured that I don't think they want more picks. And one of the things I feel like when they're sitting at the end of the first round where they can't get a blue chip guy, that if number 12's there at 19, they'll they'll deal. Or if they, and especially with these quarterbacks, right? Like six quarterbacks going early, that starts to sound like position players. That, you know, that they're getting number 21 now. And all of a sudden, if number nine on their board is there at 16, would they give away a three in next year's two? To me, that they do this better than anyone, especially with the comp picks and whatnot. But this year, doesn't feel like they want 12 picks. Doesn't feel like they want to go the other way. Yeah. It would seem to me if they could get a Pearl, a starter, a top 15 guy in their mind on the board and a draft where they're sitting on 27, that's a win no matter what they have mm -hmm. to give away if that, that, that guy comes. Yeah, and I think you look at it and they already have pretty much – three extra mid round picks in, in their Kofers for, you know, David Cully leaving next year and Judon and Ngakwe leaving. So if you, if there's a deal that calls, uh, you know, calls for you to trade maybe next year's third or next year's second, you know, you have three picks that uh, you could use where, you know, you're not going to be short on picks next year. They do have a very young roster. Um, Isn't that the reason considered. they have Lamar to some degree? Because yeah. they had so much powder in the, you know, yeah, in the keg, literally. So if, if they, you know, and every year, I think there's one or two guys, as you mentioned, that look. And, and you know, it was that one year, several years ago, was uh, Marshawn Lattimore, the cornerback. They wanted him. He slept, he fell out of the top 10. They tried to go up and get him and the saints wanted him too, and weren't going to allow that to happen. So they didn't get him and they settled for Mar uh, Marlon Humphrey, which has worked out pretty good. <laughs> so, but yeah, there'll be a couple guys that if they kind of slide, uh, you know, into a certain spot, I'd imagine they could be aggressive to go get them. Um, it's just, you know, everyone just expects them to trade back because that's what they've done. But this draft is not really heavy on star power. It's good depth, but not a heavy on star power. So there's no guarantee that when they're on the clock, the phone's going to ring. You know, they, they they may not get any offers. There's been years where their phone hasn't rang when they're on the clock. So you can't just bank on trading back when you don't know if there's going to be kind of a market for that pick. Jeff Strebeck's here. He's from The Athletic, formerly the Baltimore Sun, uh, formerly of a press box near me. Uh, now, I guess it'll be with plastic shields and whatnot. Yeah. We were together in, uh, let's see, did you, you didn't go to Houston. We were not together. I was uh, in Houston and you weren't. Yeah. Were you yeah. in Philly or Washington? One of yeah, those? I went to Philly, Washington. Yeah, yes. I did those games too. Um, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about the draft because I mean, we can get back into how weird uh, – because we don't, we don't get together that often. But the wide receiver thing, right? Like, I waited 35 minutes into the press conference. As you can see, I'm not, you know, on a horse shack up in the front of the room, <laughs> you know, yelling the questions or whatever. And I kind of let these things play out because I don't take them seriously. I mean, they're like hostage videos. Every one of them across every sport to me feels like a hostage video. As a media person that's actually sat in these rooms – all these years, all my life, and done this since I was 15 years old. It's been a weird year, but I asked Carball the question about the wide receivers because they got chippy. Eric got chippy, insulted, all of that. And then I, I went back and I asked a very non-vague question. And I would ask this question to you as fanboy, if you're having the athletic fan chat with Jeff, I'd say, 
what do you think they really want out of their wide receivers? Like, give me, give me the stat sheet at the end of them winning the Super Bowl next year in LA. Yeah, they play better in week three and week four of January. Right. They win the Super Bowl. What would the stats look like for them ideally? Running the ball, healthy Lamar, healthy three headed backfield, tight end of their dreams, healthy Nick Boyle. If everything goes perfectly, how many touches does Hollywood Brown get? Or the guy who's supposed to be that, or the Antonio Brown, or the dream Sammy Watkins? Or like, I keep asking that question. And if I would have taken up another 30 seconds of the press conference, I would ask it like this and said, there's one football. You want to run it most of the time. When you run it, you want to run it more. When you run it well, the game ends. Like, I, 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 what, what, what's an ideal wide receiver room for them? Yeah, and I think that's a great question. Um, and I think just fans in general um, just don't seem to accept the fact that they're not going to be this big passing team. And, um, but I think everybody who watches this team knows – they have to do it better. They have to do it more efficiently. Um, they have to be able to show it more and create big plays off it. Um, you know, if they're running the ball 65% of the time, 60, 65%, I think that's a good recipe for them. You, you, you know, like, look, for all the talk about how this offense isn't going to work or, you know, in 2019, that passing game worked just fine. You, you know, I mean, Lamar Jackson led the league in, in pass, uh, you, you know, in uh, passing touchdowns and efficiency and all that. Um, but they also can't be the 32nd ranked passing game. You, you know, like they go off efficiency, not yards. And I get that because they throw the ball less than anyone. So obviously they're going to have fewer yards than anyone. Uh, but you can't be down in New York Jets territory either. I mean, so, you know, they're fine if, if they're going to run the ball 65% of the time, um, you know, but you need to be able to create more big plays in the passing game. You need to have that in your bag uh, in days where your running game's getting slowed down a little, and they just haven't at key moments of the, of the, you know, of the season. But there's the old question, how much do you invest in receiver when you're utilizing the position less than anybody in the league? You know, uh, you can and keep... use, utilizing it differently and yes, more efficiently yes. because you're using that chip on Willie Sneed yep. and not on Antonio Brown. Absolutely. And that's how Lamar runs 43 yards and scampers because yeah. somebody cracked down on a corner that can't catch him. And if you yeah. give him three quarters of a second lead on a corner eight yards away, he's going to at least get 25 unless he trips. Yeah, totally. So they use their receivers differently. Um, Which is a benefit know, on draft day, Jeff, right? I mean, like that, that really helps them draft a different type of guy. They've talked about this. To me, that should be their weapon next week. The, the weapon should be – are they going to draft the wide receiver? They need to draft two badass Willie Sneeds. They're real happy catching six to eight balls and real, real happy winning Super Bowls. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, this is going to be – this is how they're going to play. This is what they believe gives them the uh, uh, most chances to succeed. And, uh, you know, I, th there's that – big physical guy that's kind of like you know but that was what miles boykin was supposed to be you know the a big physical athletic guy i think if you find that type of receiver in the draft a guy who as you mentioned can block and is physical on the perimeter but also can make a clutch catch on third down or go in the red zone somebody's going to work the intermediate areas of the field you know give mark andrews some help in those areas um, you know, so, uh, uh, someone who's going to bring some, you know, physicality, nastiness outside uh, and sort of some alpha male qualities. I, I think that's a missing piece. Uh, but, you know, the people that the constant fixation that they haven't invested in receivers. Well, nobody in the NFL has picked more receivers over the last three drafts than the Ravens. Nobody. So the investment's not been in huge free agent deals, but there you get into the issue of do big time free agents want to play in this kind of offense wide receivers. I think we saw with Smith Schuster and Hilton that they don't um, Smith Schuster came out and said it, he was respectful about it, but he's like, you know uh, you know, I looked at that offense, we play against them. So um, we well, better get your guy in the draft then, right? Yeah. Eric has approached it that way. We're going to need to get these guys in the draft, build them up with Lamar, get guys that fit our certain skill sets. I have no issue with how they've approached it. My issue is have they always picked the right guy and you go back and, and I'm not criticizing Marquise Brown, 
who I think is, is going to be a very good player. I mean, you look at his stats over two seasons. He's done pretty well, and he's elevated his game in the playoffs. That matters. If he catches um, the ball every yeah. time it's thrown his way and Lamar is accurate 80 85% of the time, right, yeah. then yeah. – I don't think we're sitting here talking wide receiver. No, if they just right. caught the ball this yeah. much more last year and Lamar in the middle of the year when I don't think he was healthy, right? Like really was not the Lamar we've seen over the body of his work. If you just yeah. took October into November of last year, a little weird, you know, against the great, he, you know, he hit 190 for a month. He's a baseball, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> it happens. That's how I looked at it. Yeah. And I'm not as far away. I think the fans jumping off the boat. Jeff, I'm not the guy jumping. Off. That's the weird part about Harbaugh shooting to me at the press conference. I'm like, I'm not the guy here starting yeah. the fire on the wide receiver. I think they believe in Duvernay. I think they believe they're going to get Boyle back. I think that's going to be a factor. I know they love their running backs. I think they're, I honestly, I think they're going to fatten up their offensive line. I've said all along until they get the right center. And if Bozeman's that guy, great. If he's not, they better find them this week. I agree with you. I think the, the, you know, I'm not in the for what, first round wide receiver camp. I'm just not. Um, and people suggesting, well, you know, they, they always settle. Well, no, they haven't. They've, you know, you have a first round pick two years ago, a third a traded up third round pick two years ago and a third round pick last year. That's not settling. That's some decent draft capital spent on a position that you utilize less and differently than the NFL. Uh, and by the way, in the, in the new world, not in Joe's offense, these were yeah, guys that completely. were specifically yep. pieces in the army that you want to win your next Super Bowl win, yeah. period, right? So, yeah, so I, I'm with you. Um, you know, I, I, this is mock draft crazy, and we're just doing a two-round one. My first pick, uh, you know, was an offensive lineman. Um, you know, I think the where the areas where you look are offensive line and edge rusher, but um, you know, also people acting like this is just the receiver position holding back the offense at the key moments. I'm just not buying it. If you go back and look at all three playoff losses, even going back to the Chargers one, um, you know, in Lamar's first year, the offensive line was completely dominated in the playoffs. Um, you know, even you go back to that Titans game. Marshall Yonda played one of his worst games in years, and I'm not putting it all on him. The offensive line was dominated against the Bills. That was not a very talented Bills front, and the offensive line got overrun in that game. So I don't think adding this quote-unquote number one receiver is going to fix all that ails them at key moments. Can it help? Of course. Uh, a lot of things can help. But I think it's a multifaceted issue to fixing this passing game where it's going to be at its best when it's needed most. I think it starts with the O-line. I think it continues with Lamar Jackson. Uh, I mean, there were plays to be made in that Bills game. Uh, there really were, uh, you know, and watching the tape and watching people who know more football than me break out the tape. He missed some plays. He just wasn't seeing the field very well in that game. Um, and then you get to him and you get to Greg Roman's role in it. And then you have the receivers. This is a multifaceted thing. I think people think you throw a number one receiver in there and okay, everything's fixed. Uh, we're going to the Super Bowl, and I don't see it like that. I don't think they're just a, a bona fide number one receiver away from being kind of a championship team. I think it's going to require some, you know, alterations and improvements in several areas. Jeff Streetbeck is here from The Athletic. Hope you're following him out on Twitter and subscribing while it's cheap, cheap, cheap. And uh, uh, he's working with uh, other reporters on doing a little piece on uh, Lamar and, and draft history and Josh Allen. I uh, hope you go check that out as well. I'll give you a chance to talk about that all you want. But this edge rusher thing and, and the Duvernay thing from last year and, and whether they're happy with the wide receivers and what their perception would be of their needs. What, you know, mm -hmm. we always have in, in your little, you know, scorecard, but in the, you know, you'll yeah. say top three needs, yeah. wide receiver, edge rusher, center, interior line, you know, like, okay, put that in whatever order you want. Yeah. I, I always say we find out what they want on draft night. But to me, if a safety, if they're number one safety, you know, what I mean? if something dropped in the right way where they got, one of the eight, 10 players that they see as separate from the rest of the guys. I think all that edge, these three positions go off of that, but I see them drafting one of these positions or I would be shocked unless they get their player. But the edge rush thing is fascinating to me because 
This was a defensive space, you know, space and place and getting after the quarterback. They've always managed to sign veteran guys and bring those guys in much like the wide receiver position, the four I mean, they got Calais Campbell out there running around now, the Trevor prices, the uh, uh, Chris Canties. I mean, they've always brought those yeah. kind of guys in, you know, drafting into this right now. It is fascinating to me because we're going to talk a little baseball before it's over with and how much baseball has changed, but man, football defenses and what they're looking for and where the value of a Ray Lewis would be right now. in this particular game in the way they scheme and the value of sort of safeties that can do a lot of things on swivel hips and maybe cover a wide receiver or a running back, I, you know, the, the edge rush things fascinating because so many teams now, Get rid of the ball before you can get to them. So it becomes much more about a Suggs kind of player that can really do both jobs. And that's really hard to find yeah. in a 240-pound guy that they're sort of looking for, right? Yeah, not a 280-pound yeah, guy. Yeah, you know? you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And actually, I just wrote a story about that. Um, you know, have they de-emphasized the edge rush position? You know, all the great Baltimore defense, we've seen those guys on the outside. Uh, but in the last couple of years, we've seen them let Zadarius Smith walk. And, you know, I think they wanted to, they wanted to keep Suggs. He just was ready for a change. And then, you know, Judon Ngakwe and Jaha were this year. And, um, you know, they really haven't replaced them. I, I mean, you know, you make the Ngakwe trade and, and then, you get, you know, Bowser, that's a modest deal for an outside linebacker and McPhee's on the league minimum. And, you know, they do studies. We all see it. And you mentioned it. Um, you know, quarterbacks are getting the ball out quick. Sacks have been dramatically down in, you know, two years ago, the end of teams were averaging a little over 40 sacks a year. This year, they were closer to 35. I mean, five sacks each per team less is significant, you know. And that's uh, less quarterbacks getting cream, too. Completely. So, uh, so the Ravens have, you know, uh, the Ravens are aware of these stats. Uh, you know, they do studies on this. And it's clear they've emphasized over the years – corners cover you know there's all debate in football what's more important coverage or pressure and we know what the Ravens side are on with how much money they've spent in that cornerback group and how much money they haven't spent on pass rushers uh, I think they know they need need to get a guy but I don't think that stops and ends really uh, in Thursday's first round or, or Friday's second round second third round you know you have the comp deadline uh, May 3rd they're sitting on two comp picks you have four or five accomplished pass rushers still out in the free agent market. They've already met with Justin Houston. So I don't think they had, they go into this thing and we have to get a pass rusher. I do think they'll get one and relatively early and, and this draft leans to perhaps getting a still a, a day one kind of guy on, on, you know, day two or three on day two or early on day three of the draft, but they still have some, you know, they still have some moves there up their sleeves, but I agree. I, I just don't think, NFL's changed, you know, their defenses pride self on versatility and having all these parts and they blitz more than any other team in the league. So there's a sense there, at least for me on the outside reading it, look, we've proven we can get to the quarterback by blitzing. Why drop 18, 19 million a year on a pass rusher when we can do it in other ways and spread that money out in other positions and be this versatile defense. Now, if Khalil Mack is sitting there, that's a different story. Uh, but I don't think they viewed like Ngakwe and Judon as these every down impact edge rushers that are going to kind of change the face of their defense. And those guys are hard to find. Dude, look at how good they've been the last three years. And we'll give them all praise and I'll allow you some oxygen to do that as well. But Dude, they were two weeks into the season two years ago and are grabbing Josh Bynes and LJ Fort off the street. Jihad yeah. Ward, too, by the Justin way. Justin Ellis. Now you're talking yeah. about, we, we, you know, you, you, you can't afford to lose any of these guys. And then they let Mosley walk, right, over money, which is fine, winds up being fi a fine decision, right? I wasn't anti that at any point. And, and, and now playing sort of naked without linebackers all of a sudden, at least in April, and Ozzy would say, if we had to play, we could, but... I mean, they don't have to play for six months, to your point. Justin Houston, three other guys we haven't heard of will be there in, an, in a uniform and ready to play yep. uh, by August 31st, right? But I, there, there is a point for them where the linebacker thing has been dramatically de-emphasized at some po yeah. point. And, and I don't know that pick 27 to me sounds like that has to go that direction the no, way yeah. some fans maybe think it does. Yeah, if you think you can get if you know, and, you know, we know how the Ravens work they may have a wink wink deal with one of these veteran linebackers. Like, yeah, we're going to sign you, but we're going to sign you on May 3rd, you know, and because we'll keep our two mid round comp picks. 
uh, that may already be happened. So if, if that's in place, they won't, you know, they're not going to say they have to pick an edge rusher. I do think the strength of that, there's a ton of edge rushers that are supposed to go off late in the first round, early in the second and kind of throughout the second round. So where they're drafting alone leans itself to that consideration, but you brought up a safety, you know, you brought up that earlier and, you know, they could probably get the top safety where they're drafting uh, Deshaun Elliott's on the last year of his deal. They don't have a number three safety really right now. I don't think they view Geno Stone necessarily as that guy, although he could be. Well, can but. you imagine Twitter five minutes after that, oh. right? Like, and you and I, we, we know we're both right. Yeah. And they, they almost bled it out as a breadcrumb to sort of like, you know, like maybe. I mean, that's yeah. the game they play anyway, but, you know, it, it yeah, wouldn't shock me. It wouldn't shock no, you. No, it wouldn't. It absolutely wouldn't shock me. And, and you look at the type of defense they play. And, you know, first of all, they need a, another safety for depth. Second of all, you know, Chuck Clark and Deshaun Elliott are good players, but they're, they're a different type of safety that, you know, they're, they don't have that ball hawk rangy center field safety who's going to get his hands on the ball and create turnovers. I mean, in 16 game regular season games last year, Clark and Elliott combined for one interception and eight pass breakups. I mean, that was a good two weeks for Ed Reed. Now, I'm not comparing anyone to Ed Reed, but they are missing that guy who can and who can turn the ball over on the back end and kind of create plays and and you know they have had trouble in the past covering tight ends that guy who can match up a little better with some tight ends um you know they're in that range they could get the number one safety the kid from TS, tcu probably at 27 or or shortly thereafter if they want to trade back a couple picks uh martindale loves putting dbs on the field it makes sense it's not going to be popular mind you although i think we both know that unless a receiver is called uh, on 27, <laughs> people are going to find a way to complain about it regardless. Oh, they watch this stuff, but do they pay attention? <laughs> Jeff Srebeck is here from The Athletic. You can go find him uh, and his work on um, – I want to bring this to Lamar here, and then we'll go baseball and crab cakes. I'll let you get out of here. But um, uh, Lamar and money and what $40 million looks like against the cap, especially this year – we're always asking this question, how's Lamar and the money thing and whatever. And I'm thinking, I don't know how hung up they are on that. And I haven't even brought up Orlando Brown because yeah. I think I've talked about it on the radio and not a lot, but more than Eric's talked about it. Cause I don't think the Orlando Brown thing has any legs at all. And I would be blown away if they get what they feel like is value, unless they really, if they give him away for three or something it just means they really want to get rid of him. And I, and I don't, fashion that it's at that level no no and, and if it is there i mean this all season is all about building the you know they prioritize building a great offensive line um and you trade it do you trade a legitimate you know pro bowl you know tackle no i i you know the the issues there there's three or four one this is a really good tackle draft you know so people you know there's a bunch of teams feel like they can find their tackle even as late as the second round two Orlando Brown wants a lot of money on a contract extension. Um, and do you, you're not just giving up prime draft capital to get him. You're also paying him 18 million a year. I, I mean, can you stomach that? And then three, you know, what is Lor Or Orlando Brown as a left tackle? I, I love the kid. I know you have a great relationship with the family, but um, you know, he only played half a season there and playing left tackle for the Ravens is different than playing it for any other team. I mean, look, this doesn't take anything away from the offensive linemen they have, but the way they run the ball and the way they protect their offensive linemen and the way Lamar Jackson's mobility makes offensive linemen look better. I don't know that teams out there, I think teams out there will have the question, will he be as good in our scheme as he is in the Ravens scheme, which is very offensive line friendly. Um, and so th those issues there, he's your left tackle and you're passing 51 times a week. I don't know. The, at 18 million a year. And after giving up a first form, I, I agree. Now, and if you're giving your quarterback $40 million a year, you're looking to pass at least 38 to 40. Times yeah. A week. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. I mean, look, all it takes is one, one team to fall in love with them and one team to get shut out at the tackle market. And maybe, you know, maybe Eric's getting a call on, on late night on that Thursday after the first round when a team that really wants them 
uh, or a team that really wanted a left tackle, didn't get the guy they want. And suddenly Orlando Brown looks like a pretty good consolation prize and they're willing to trade an early two and maybe another pick or maybe a future number one, something like that. I could see it, but uh, the market there has been pretty quiet. Uh, I call it very, very ago. unlikely. Vegas what? has that at, uh, at 35 <laughs> to one, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah, totally. I mean, I, I, it's a lot. It's a lot of things you have to overcome uh, to make that deal and you have to be comfortable with. Well, the thing to overcome, to bring it full circle back to where I brought Lamar, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm speaking in tongues here with you because you and I go at this pretty good, but the Lamar part of the contract and where they are would say, we're built to win yesterday. We're pissed yeah. we didn't win 10, 10 weeks ago. We have to win next February because things get a little different when Lamar's got to get paid and Mark Andrews won't be here anymore. And, you know, Orlando Brown won't be here anymore. And Matt Judon's not here anymore. So, uh, you know, there's all of these things that are going to happen when Lamar happens that the fans thought they were unhappy with Joe. Why do they pay him? And he hasn't won yet. Right. He hasn't yeah. been the, he, like literally. Um, but that's, what's going to have to happen here. That's the leap of faith. We all take here. Right. Completely. And, and, you know, you said something earlier um, about the liars luncheon and, and, and is absolutely correct. Eric drops crumbs at times, you know, he, he, he goes into this with the thinking man's perspective and he, one of the first thing he mentioned when he was asked about Lamar's contract was, we think Lamar is a patient guy. Um, and to me, all along, and I know this isn't a popular opinion, but to me, it makes sense to wait on that until next offseason. Now, you may wind up having to pay more, but if you do wind up having to pay more, it's going to be because the Ravens had a great season and won something, and you're happy you have to do that. Can you like, see Steve just having this with a cigar and saying <laughs> – Joe got into me for 20 million too much. Best 20 million I ever spent. You know, I, you know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's Steve, right. Yeah. I mean, if, I, if I would gets into me because we go too far next year. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah, totally. I mean, I would want to see more, not just from Lamar, from the offense, the style of their offense, they play. Can they take this next step? Is this offense sustainable over the long haul before I write that check? Um, I, I take the time I need, um, you know, and it's just, it's such a fascinating situation, Nestor, not just with the timing of it, but who are you negotiating with? His mo Lamar's mother, Lamar, Lamar's business associate. I don't, and you know, that's why Eric said we wanted to get on the same page earlier this offseason. I mean, these are high stakes deals. I'm not saying Lamar and his mom are incapable, but these, de these, these talks can get kind of, you know, contentious at times. And, and this is competitive. Well, if they're done in a traditional way. Yeah. And, and so you're talking about negotiating a deal with, with the, with your own quarterback or with the quarterback's mom or with the quarterback's friend of the family who's serving as a, it's just, there's so many issues there. This is such a fascinating story to watch, which almost even lends even more to, you know what? Let's give this another season and then we'll evaluate where we are come January or February. We'll know a little more about him, about our team, about the progress he made. And then the other issue is, you know, any deal they sign him this year is almost certainly going to eat into the little cap space they have this year. So that's the other thing you have to worry about. OK, if you're extending him, great. I know that's the big fish, uh, but are we doing something? Do we have to, you know, do something? Are we losing another player to accommodate him on an extension a year early? So there's a lot that has to go into. It's absolutely fascinating situation. Uh, I wouldn't be in any rush on that one. And I wonder if that's why Eric made the point, look, Lamar is a patient person kind of, you know, trying to, you know, make sure everybody knows that we don't have to do this this off season. And Lamar knows that. Jeff Strayback is here from The Athletic. I remember back when he was, uh, you know, covering the uh, things when Brady Anderson and uh, Peter Angelos would do their contracts at Boccaccio late at night. Uh -huh. And then later on, Brady would run the team, uh, you know, by proxy. And then Chris Davis would just go into the owner's office, put his feet up. And get. Um, <laughs> is there anything you want to say about baseball? I mean, I, I know you're happily off that beat and whatnot, but I have the parking lots behind me and. Uh, we have a two-year lease now. Makes you feel secure, doesn't it, Jeff? <laughs> yeah. Well, you saying that story. I uh, remember when I guess it was Sammy Sosa was in town and went down, went to Little Italy with Peter Angelos and my editors at the Sun were like, "You need to get down there. You need to get down there and talk to him." And uh, but, but the yeah, fuck I make mean, our own expense, man. We'll pay for it. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I mean, the 
I, unfortunately, Nestor, I missed, you know, I like good baseball as well as anyone, as much as anyone. And unfortunately, I missed the Dodgers and Padres series over the weekend. People were raving about that, um, you know, and a lot of young stars in that game. Obviously, the Dodgers are loaded and the Padres probably have more young talent than anyone in the league. But, you know, I, I, I'll be the first to admit, I mean, I look at some of these box scores these days or like I'll look at the lineups when, you know, one of our, you know, Baltimore Luke or somebody else in the Baltimore media will put out the lineups for the Orioles and their opponent. And I, I don't even know half these guys, you know? Oh, yeah, it, it's and, – and Luke and I had a real tit-a-tat, you know, because he's going to the games, nobody's going to the games. If I had to make a living, Jeff, talking to, to just Oriole fans about the Orioles right now, if that's what the way I had to make my living, I, there's no way. There's just no way. So, you know, I've moved my brand mainly because, like, the, I can't – think that this is going to get relevant anytime really like really relevant and that's a baseball issue as much as it's an angelos and oriola uh, you know their partners mass and streaming like go through all of the problems they have i've loved baseball my whole life you've loved baseball your whole life it's what brought you here it's why we do what we do i love this way before i love you this was never going to exist in my life it's my 30th anniversary of doing this and I would just say on the baseball side, when I put it on, I'm not sure who they're trying to appeal to because it doesn't feel like they're trying to get me back. You, you know what I mean? In any, in any real way. And the statistics, the analytics, the broadcasts, um, you know, the way you kind of need to relearn the game completely. I mean, I mentioned that on defense about how defenses are just different than they were 10 years ago. Baseball, my God, by the time this team's any good, couple, three, four years, whenever that is, when you come back, it won't just be the scorecard. It'll be the strikeouts and the home runs and nothing happening and four hour games and seven inning games and like analytics and launch angle and things you yeah. need to learn that don't, it feels like a lot of work. And I say yeah. that to Luke and he laughs at me and I'm like, all I do are talk to 50 year old white guys like me who sit here in the off season and do nothing but talk about this. Right. I mean, literally. Yeah. Yeah. I, as I was saying, I, I don't, I, I I was like, I feel like I haven't watched the sport in four years when I see some of these lineups, like, I was like, who are the, you know, who are some of these guys, but you know, the definitely. Um, and you mentioned a little bit, but, uh, the ball, uh, ball needs to be put in play more. Way too many strikeouts, uh, too many walks. Um, you know, it's just that's and and it seems like they recognize that that that's a problem. Uh, but so much about it, you're right. You know, has changed the shifts and and, and all that. And everybody pitcher comes in, he's got to face a couple of batter. Yeah, you know, yeah. like you just have to get with how is the game played. Literally, I mean, yeah. I'm and I'm not being an old get off my lawn guy, but yeah. learning all of this stuff and coming back, they're asking a lot. It's, they really are. It's funny. I was I was doing something around the house. I think it was during the uh, Orioles Yankee series. I had the game on in the background you know, probably about eight yards away from where I was doing something. And I walked away when they went to extra innings and I got back. I didn't think I missed anything. And there was a guy on second and I couldn't figure out the life of me, why a guy was on second. And I had totally forgotten that that's where a guy starts in extra innings. I thought I actually missed a double. Jeff, I, I, like, I think <laughs> I had you on the last time you and I were on, I was pissy in the middle of the plague, maybe back in August or whatever. Yeah. And I started in every reference talking about Eddie Fainer. And if I said Eddie Fainer to you, mm -hmm. you, you remember the softball pitcher. Mm -hmm. And I started that reference when baseball began in August and football was trying to rev up the engine and hockey went into a tent and basketball went into a bubble and like all of that right and I said does it feel real or does it feel like a weekend beer league tournament you know what I mean <laughs> does it feel like an exhibition or does it feel like a tournament or does it feel like real and the football season felt real right he, even when they're playing a Wednesday afternoon in Pittsburgh even when you and I are watching on TV and yeah. on these hostage videos it felt like a real season baseball didn't it just didn't. It felt like a 60 week, you know, 60 game sort of tournament. Right. That's why Eddie feigned it. And then you put this on. We're already two weeks into this. I've had games in seven innings. Right. You're sitting there in the fifth inning of a game, sunshine. And you're like, are you going to hurry? I, you yeah. know what I mean? Like the sunshine. Like you got 14 freaking pitchers. 
You, you know what I mean? Like you don't have enough pitching. Like I don't, yeah. I, I, that's the part that is befuddling to me and these Harvard nerds running it and trying to get my arms around. What are they trying to do? Like what, what's, what's the strategy here? If I have to go on the radio and explain what the Orioles are doing to people, I have a hard time explaining it on it. I have a hard time comprehending what they're doing with pitching and 14 pitchers and, and, and just yeah. the franchise in trying to sort of burn out Mancini and these guys to get more draft picks so that somewhere three years from now, we might want to come back. It's really weird to me to try yeah. to sell it. Yeah. And I mean, it's just, the question becomes, you know, when does it become about winning? You know, when is it, you know, you all in the off season, I get what they're doing, but in the off season, you dump a couple of your better players, uh, you know, the second baseman, Hanser Alberto, who have we seen, they don't have a second baseman on that roster right now. And, you know, um, with the, the Rio or, or Nunez, you know, who I guess led him in home runs, just dumped him for kind of nothing, you know, like fringe kind of player to be named type things, non-tender situations. So they lose every um, night and I'm like, they're trying to lose. They're yeah. really not trying to win. They're set up like a double A team. And, it, and it's so you know? funny. I watch them and, and, you know, I obviously this won't be shown out when their final record is, you know, it, you can't, we've covered enough baseball seasons where we know you do not evaluate a team at this time of year. You, you know, it's some teams start, you know, the Mariners had the best record in the league in the AL uh, as of a couple of days ago, I can guarantee you that's not going to, that's not going to hold. I, I've not heard of half the guys on their team. Um, you know, so it, at in the end of the day, you'll be what your record says as Buck Showalter uh, he used to say, but yeah, it's, you know, it's frustrating. I don't know when the, the focus turns on, you know, we need to start winning some games and we need to win now and, and how long people will afford to be patient uh, because they've gotten already uh, quite a bit of patience. Um, and I just don't know when that, uh, you know, when that runs out from fans, I just like to watch good baseball. You know, that's the period. Uh, you know, I covered the Orioles for a long time. I, I have friends that cover the team, friends that work for the team. So uh, I I'm happy when they're happy, but you know, you just want to watch good baseball when it all comes down to it. Jeff Schreibeck is here. He watched bad baseball and has watched a lot of good football. We'll be watching a good football draft. Hopefully uh, the commission will have some cocoa before midnight and the uh, Ravens won't uh, deal into Friday. But go ahead, Eric, do whatever you want, dude. I'm not going to be the critical guy on Friday morning. Nobody even had to go out to the castle and getting fed to be pissed off. Last thing for you, man. You're How long in Baltimore for you now? Two decades? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I went to... I went to college, you know, I, I graduated from Loyola. Um, so I went to college here. So when did you um, arrive then? When did you come off the boat from Jersey? 97. Wow. 25 years almost. Yeah, yeah. Oh man. God, I'm <laughs> celebrating 30 on the radio. You've been here. So, so I'm going to ask you, this is a legit question then for you. Cause I mean, you're almost a Baltimorean. I'm doing this crab cake tour, right? I'm going to, for the rest of my life, every Friday, I'm going to have a crab cake and a conversation by crab cake diplomacy. It's a way to bring the old Trump people together with normal people, you know, like the, all that, right? Um, if you, when someone lands in Baltimore and you pick them up, if, oh. you know, Cal Ripken's taking you and Ray Lewis are having a crab cake with you and you're doing it on the athletics dime, where <laughs> are you taking them? I want your crab cake place. Wow. That's a tough one. And you can Ooh. answer anything you want. I mean, there's no, it's non-denominational, you know, I don't have to like it or love it, but I, I'm just asking everyone that question. And if you need more time to think about it, you can answer it the next time you come on. It's fine. Yeah. Let me do that because I've had a couple recently. And um, I'm trying to think, and I don't want to short anybody. Um, but yeah, let me hit. Let me get you back. You to can you. hit me privately. It's fine. Yeah, hey, I yeah. put you on the spot. That's I'll fine. I mean, I'll definitely, definitely give you. I'll definitely give you a good answer. See, this one. happened for me because I do business with Fadley's and I do business with Costas. My cousin yeah. came to town, sent in the Costas. Fadley's was closed because it was a nighttime weekend. It was he was on a casino junket because he's half crazy, and um, and then I got into this conversation about like where if I were taking you out and it weren't Fadley's or Costas, there's a billion places and they're all trying to come back to life and do business. We all know that, right? After the pandemic. So I'm going to go try crab cakes because I love them and they're different everywhere, right? Yeah. And this is my big chance. So I'm going to have you for a crab cake next time we get together. How about that? 
Sounds good. Looking forward to it, and I'll get you a name. I mean, or some chicken that's... from Chicken uh, Chicken Palooza from uh, from Royal Farms. This Royal is Farms, last year's all right, show. absolutely. Hey, <laughs> real, real fresh, real fast. I love all my sponsors. Wise Markets is now sponsoring us as well. This is a wise conversation, Jeff Reback. <laughs> Tell everybody what you did with Lamar and uh, and uh, Josh Allen because I it is draft week. I want to give you a chance. Yeah, to talk yeah. I worked on a I worked on a story, um, and you know I think it'll be out early next week about. Um, you know, the 2018 first round when we saw the five quarterbacks go off the board, sort of like we probably will see Thursday, uh, five quarterbacks go off the board and, and in similar fashion, you know, there's a bunch of guys that will go in the top 10 and maybe someone will slip and you know how the bills and, and Ravens wound up, uh, arriving at getting their guy and, and the two guys from that draft that have been the most winningest. Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson were the most polarizing, you know, some people didn't want them. Um, Other people did. And, and it's kind of a look about how the Ravens and bills kind of settled on their guy and how it's worked out. And, you know, from the Ravens perspective, you know, and the, I had other reporters work on this is Steve Pichotti was heavily involved in Lamar Jackson. Um, This was not a pop, you know, even in the Ravens building. um, I think there was more than 50% of the people in that building that were not totally behind that pick. Not that they didn't like Lamar. You know, they liked Lamar. They thought he was a great athlete. They thought it could work. But they didn't get the vision for what they were going to have to become with Lamar as the quarterback. Going and, from gas to hybrid. Yes. Or going, you know what I mean? Making that leap of faith to, to yeah. solar. <laughs> yeah. And, and there was no – there was over 50% of the people in that building were not – didn't see it. Didn't see how it worked. Didn't – thought it was too risky. But you know what? The people that mattered or the people that matter most, I should say, the owner, the head coach, GM, they saw it. They were sold on this vision. And it's not like they went to that draft saying we have to have Lamar Jackson. Uh, They wouldn't have drafted, traded back twice, and drafted Hayden Hurst if that was their attitude. But their attitude was if we can get this guy at the right place, uh, which they determined was late in the first round, and we could add well, the around, extra year. The extra yeah, year was really, absolutely. Yeah. and we could add around him and get some pieces that'll help Joe in the in the immediate a tight end who we know Joe loves throwing tight ends and and a, and a top tackle like Orlando Brown and another tight end like Mark Andrews. Like we're getting these pieces to help maybe Joe, and ultimately they're going to transition to guys that are going to help Lamar. So it's just it was you know like we look back on it and uh you know uh the whole decision making process and, and the risk they took i, I you, you got to be they have to be applauded for it because there was 31 other teams that were not willing to take that trip with lamar at least at that point in the draft do you think if eric had his third drink he would say to the fan base i traded into the first round to get him for an extra year now you want me to give the extra year back and give him 30 million you're out of your mind that's terrible <laughs> it's not, that's not a good is that good is that it's probably, probably not far <laughs> off right a little yeah. bit close yeah, well, I mean, look. Well, the extra year is what they're, they're you know, the fans Ooh. are trying to give away. And they knew what right? they were getting. You know, they knew this was not going to be, a, you know, like they had way more success early than they ever thought in a million years they would have, you know. So uh, it's interesting. I, I mean, this will be fun, man. Uh, this will be fun. I, I, as I said to you earlier, it, it kind of hits home how much I miss just the being at the facility and being camaraderie around the guys and getting a feel for the building, getting to know people. I mean, you know, there's... that was like the highlight of our relationship was that sloppy cheeseburger and that <laughs> draft beer in Indianapolis on a 12 degree night. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. So... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you miss certain things, but the draft is always a, the draft is it's, it's always fun and exciting. And uh, you know, I, I, I don't expect really any surprises, but uh, you never know. I mean, this is a draft where it's hard to predict. Yeah, you know what's fascinating about covering this team is they're really good at doing it. So, if, you know, you can only wake up and second-guess them so much given the level of success. But it is fun to second-guess them, and it's fun to be at the Liars' luncheon. And I mean, we've sat here for the better part of an hour chewing the fat in the same way they are in the building, and it's a great time of the year to be doing that. Yeah. Uh, it beats where we were a year ago, and no the schedule's now coming out May 12th, well, and we're going to Vegas! We're going yeah. to Vegas! I mean, the, the, the road schedule, Chicago and Denver. Detroit, and some... baby! You and yeah. me and Greek down! Yeah! 
yeah. Maybe right. Thanksgiving. Maybe they'll make that the Thanksgiving game this year. You know what? I, yeah, I hope so, man. Let's let's keep it weird. It's 21, right? Yeah. Jeff's read back at The Athletic. No one covers sports better than they do. Make sure you go out, subscribe, check out all that they're doing. You subscribe once, you get the whole world, including Ken Rosenthal uh, out there and uh, Dan Connolly and some others as well. Keep up the good work, man. I'll, uh, you know, when the Orioles win, I'll make both buildings orange, okay? <laughs> Sounds good, man. Great talking to you. Jeff's read back from The Athletic joining us here. All of our wise conversations presented by our friends at Wise markets we're going to be telling you more about rounding up for the muscular dystrophy association rob santoni joined me as did alice who is a nine-year-old who is uh, going to camp and doing summer camp virtually this year hoping to get her back on the zip line next year i promised her i'd zip line this summer on my crab cake tour in august eating that true blue maryland crab meat i am nestor we are wnst.net am 1570 taos in baltimore we never stop talking baltimore positive